Um, okay, T today I talk with uh, Tony Delk, uh, 10 season NBA veteran and as well NBA champion, uh, NCAA champion from 1996. And, uh, I would like to start with your NCAA uh, career. Uh, in 1996, you won uh, NCAA title with uh, Kentucky. And how could you compare these emotions which are um, at this university level, basketball level, and uh, compare it to NBA playoffs? Or is it possible to compare it? I mean, I, I think it's different levels. I think when you um, are a college athlete, you know, you don't know the the uh, severity of, you know, playing through injuries and just trying to get, trying to complete a season without, you know, um, without guys getting hurt. But when you uh, can walk away, you know, in a four-year span of having gone to Final Four, which is like the height of most collegiate players, just getting into – first of all, I think just getting to the NCAA tournament is something that excites players. But, you know, the next step is, hey, can we make it to the Final Four? So I got a chance to go to the Final Four my first year as a Kentucky basketball player, and we ended up losing to Michigan. Uh, so that – I had already felt, you know, how – how great it was to get to the final four, but, you know, we finally were able to get to the final four and get to the national championship game in 96. I mean, it was the highlight of my basketball career because, you know, when you see your, your teammates and, and yourself, you know, all the hard work and, you know, dedication that goes into playing a game. And then you finally get a chance to cut down the nest at the end. I mean, it was a special moment, not only for myself, but to all the guys that, uh, that played that year. And then once I made it to the NBA, the, uh, the playoff was def definitely a different level of intensity, you know, because now it's not about just winning that one game. You have to try to win a series. And that's, I think that's the difference in when you go through a, a, a NBA playoff is that you got to win multiple series, you know, in order to get that, to cut mm -hmm. that, not really cut the nets down, but to hold up that trophy at the end of, um, you know, of a championship season. But, you know, the comparison, for me, you know, having won a EuroLeague championship, won a, a college championship, I wish I could have put an NBA championship on my on my <laughs> resume. Mm -hmm. And what is uh, what is special in uh, Kentucky uh, as a as a university organization? Because we know that uh, a lot of uh, great players uh, graduate from from this university, and it's well known from uh, creating future stars in the NBA. I think it's, it's more important just to understand the history and the tradition of Kentucky and myself coming from Tennessee. I really didn't know how, you know, how huge that, that, that tradition was and just how, um, how the fans were, how the fans reacted to us and how they treated us and just how big that uh, basketball was in the state of Kentucky. You know, it's kind of like any, anywhere we travel, you know, they always put it in the terms of being like a rock star NBA player. And we never thought about that as, you know, 18, 19 year old kids going, you know, signed a letter of intent to go to Kentucky. Like, you know, these people are going to treat us special. And that's what it was about, you know. So but it, it, it started with guys that paved the way for myself and so many other uh, black athletes there, because at one point in time, you know, uh, some black athletes weren't, weren't allowed to play at the University of Kentucky. So someone had to pave the way and open the door for, you know, black athletes to start playing there. So once, you know, that opened up and then, you know, they start seeing what the talent that we have, but also just being good individuals, you know, because you don't want to get caught up in saying, well, just because he's from a, he's a minority that, you know, he's not, he doesn't understand how college life is and what it takes to be a college student. So when I signed a letter of intent, it was more about going to the University of Kentucky and trying to get my degree and finishing school. And at the time, I didn't think about the NBA. Uh, I was more about trying to be a, uh, a college graduate and, you know, and, and show my mom, you know, just all the hard work and dedication that my mom and dad put in, you know, and allow me to live under household and, um, you know, be, being a, a good kid. But, you know, the reward was going to college, coming back and, you know, being a, a college graduate. So I was more focused on that. Mm -hmm. And in 1996, uh, you were selected by Charlotte Hornets uh, with the 16 uh, pick uh, in the NBA draft. And uh, what was your reaction? Did you expect it uh, to, to be drafted and to draft it with this uh, with this pick? Uh, you know, I, I think I had a chance to work on to work 
uh, have tryouts with teams from the ninth pick to about the 24th pick. So I knew I was going somewhere between, you know, the mid first round. Um, you know, so I was, I was excited about the opportunity. You know, when you get a chance to work out for these NBA teams and you talk to different GMs and having an agent at the time who was, um, Steve Kaufman, you know, we really talked about our plan. Like, you know, Hey, these are the teams you're going to work out for. So, you know, the number one thing was being in shape, being prepared, being ready to play and, uh, you know, just having a good showing. So when I got a chance to go and work out for Charlotte the first time, there was no coach there. And so I really worked out in front of the GM and some of the team scouts. And when I came back the second time, I want to say they hired Dave Cowens. And I was just the right fit for what they were looking for at the time, being a, a, a veteran play, a veteran college player. You know, I, I wasn't like a one-and-done guy out of college, but also I was a player that, you know, I brought experience. I won a championship. I played with really good players in college. So that kind of prepared me and made the transition a little bit easier to go from college to the NBA because I already played with so many good players, but it still was a, a transition because those guys were experienced. I had played, you know, a 36 game season. Now you think about an 82 game season, it really, what I found out really, it really beats your body up because I went from mm -hmm. like middle school to high school to college and I never missed a game. And I remember probably about the 20th, 20th game mark of my first rookie season was I got hurt. So I'd never really been injured and missed games. And some of that is it's a grind, you know, when you got to play a, another, you know, it's almost like three seasons of college basketball that you're playing in one mm -hmm. NBA season. So it, it was definitely uh, taking a toll on my body, but my body also had to get used to playing at that level of intensity, but also, you know, just the grind of traveling and playing, um, you know, four or five games a week. Mm hmm. And to, how do you remember uh, your rookie season? Do you've got some uh, special task or some uh, funny pranks pro, from your teammates? Well, you know, being a rookie, you got you had you have to bring food to the uh, to the veteran players. So Malik Rose and I, who was assistant uh, GM with Detroit Pistons, you know, so we would always go to Krispy Kreme and we had to bring boxes of donuts. They would kick the balls in the stands. We had we would have to put the balls back on the rack. So I mean, there was rookie. <laughs> Rookie initiation that, you know, um, Malik and I, and I think we might have one more rookie. I think it was Carlos Strong at the time. So we always had to do the duty of maybe cleaning up or, you know, whatever, delivering papers to the guys on the road. So it, it was it was your rookie initiation. <laughs> but it was – but, but you know, I, we had some really good rookie – I mean, veteran guys. And Anthony Mason was one of the guys that kind of took me under his wings. And what I enjoyed about him is that he just taught me so much about life. You know, you know he's mm – -hmm. RIP to my dude, you know, he was someone that as a veteran guy, you know, he taught me how to play, you know, get better at the position of playing a, a point guard because I never really played point guard, you know, throughout, throughout high school or college. I was always a combo guard or scorer. Mm -hmm. So just watching him and just talking to him, man, he, he meant a lot. He really helped my um, rookie season evolve because of, you know, just his, his work ethic. You know, he worked extremely hard, not only on his game, but outside of, of the game of basketball because he, he came from the CBA. So he understood that, you know, it, it was a grind to get to the NBA and don't just be satisfied with getting here. Can you sustain your, uh, can you sustain and have a career? So some guys come and only play one year in the NBA. So, you know, I learned from him like, Hey man, try to make this a career. And by, by making a career, take care of your body, be on time, stay late, um, watch film, ask questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, during 2001 and 2000 season, you were traded to Boston Celtics and it was an opportunity to play again with your teammates from Kentucky, with Anton Walker and Holter McCarthy. And uh, was it the best moment in your career from this time perspective? I think it was, you know, it, it was cool to play with them. I wasn't a huge fan of, um, of not, I wouldn't say the city Boston, but just cold weather. So I actually was uh, with Sacramento for a year, Golden State for two years, and I was in Phoenix for a year and a half before that trade took place. So I, I, I'm, my body, and I found out later, like, I really like warm weather. So I'm not, my body doesn't function well in cold weather. So when I left Phoenix and went to Boston, it was probably like a, like 11 degrees there. It was so cold. And <laughs> my body wasn't ready for, my, my body was, was, was shocked by, you know, just how cold it was. When you leave, a place like Arizona, then you go to Boston where it's so cold. Um, you know, 
I, I enjoy playing with Walter uh, as well as, you know, Antoine. And then my college coach, Jim O'Brien, was a coach there. So he knew my game. So mm -hmm. it, it was it was tailor-made for me to play with those guys, but I just wish it was in a different city. Mm -hmm. uh, you play in, uh, in eight teams, and I guess that it was quite difficult to change teams and change uh, the daily routine, the place when you lived. And what was the most difficult uh, with being traded or, uh, or signing a contract with the other team? You know, it, it was always difficult, man, because I really, I really thought the team didn't give me a chance really to blossom as a player. You know, when you get traded, you know, one or two years into, especially my, when I got, when I got to Phoenix, I was hoping that Phoenix was, I was going to be there for the next five or six years, at, le at least throughout my contract, because I signed a six-year contract with them. So it was a place that I wanted to go. I made my choice. Like I said earlier about the warm weather, it was, it was a perfect environment for me. And after leaving Charlotte and being playing two years and going to state and playing in Sacramento, I was like, man, this is going to be home for me. So I actually went out and bought a home for the first time because I was thinking that I was going to be there for at least a few years. But, but you know, I, you find out it's a business at the end of the day. You know, it's a business where if there's a better opportunity out there for an organization, they're going to make the best decision for them. So it's one of them deals I wish I could have signed like a no trade clause or a deal that if I got traded, I got paid so much money up front for being traded. So if I were to if I could relive the moment and, and redo the deal all over again, it would have definitely have some more perks in it for me. Or, you know, there would have been something where, Hey, you want to trade me or buy me on my contract? You know, I would like my money to be deferred, you know, and that way I would have, you know, deferred with an interest rate. So there's things that I know now that I didn't know then that would have probably kept me in some places if I could have had a different contract. Cause when there was a contract where, a team got to pay a 15 to, to $20 million trade trade clause is that mm -hmm. that protects the player and the teams are reluctant to trade players, you know, because now you have to pay the player more money and it's going to, it's going to count against your books or there's going to be deferred money with interest rate that a team will have to pay you for the next 10 to 15 years. So those are things that I wish my agent had done a better job of protecting me, knowing that I had been traded and played on so many teams that he'd have been like, hey, you know what, Tony, it's time for me to put a good deal in place that, that works for you. Mm -hmm. And what was the best game in your NBA career? And do, 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 do you remember the, 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 this kind of game? I've, I've had, you know, uh, people always say, you know, like the 53-point game I had uh, playing against Sacramento. But, I mean, I remember having a really good game where I had like 28, 29 points, 12 or 13 rebounds, eight or nine assists, you know, three or four steals, and that was a game to me that really stood out. I, I want to say it was at home when I played for Phoenix Suns against Portland Trailblazers. I had a really good game. I had just had a really good all-around game. Everyone is going to talk about the 53-point game I had, you know, where I was really feeling it, and I had a really good shooting night, but I, I wanted to be a complete player. I didn't want to just be a, a one-dimensional player that only shot the ball. Like, I wanted to make sure I rebounded, I defended, and I did things that always didn't, didn't get on the books, but it was something that um, as I worked on my game and as I trained kids here in Atlanta, Georgia, I always tell them, you know, try to be a complete player, you know, because some nights you're not going to make shots, but can you do other things to help your team win games? And it's more than just scoring. Can you rebound? Can you get assists? Are you willing to defend? Are you going to dive on the, on the floor for loose balls? All the little things that people don't like were some of the things that I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And after NBA, um, you went to Europe and play uh, in Panathinaikos. Uh, it was really, really um, effective here because you won the, the Greek League, uh, the Cup, uh, also the Euro League. Uh, what was the best, uh, or maybe in a different way, uh, how big was the difference between NBA and uh, Europe League? You know, I, I think the, the biggest difference was all the practices, man. Coach Robradovich is, is, was an exceptional coach, man. He's probably one of the top coaches overseas, and he, he would be a great coach in the NBA. But, you know, just I think when you go through an NBA career, um, you're not practicing as much. You know, I think you, you're, you're, seasoned, you're seasoned for the game. You understand how the game is played. And I think when you're in Europe, you know, those guys really – love to practice two or three times a day and you know it's like hard work hard work but 
Mm-hmm. Um, that was the only thing I really didn't like, you know, because when you go through a, a 82 game season and then you got to come or go over seasons like, oh, yeah, we're going to come to training camp early, we're going to run heels and, you know, we're going to work three or four hours a day in practice and come back and practice again. Like my body wasn't conditioned that, you know, my body, that was something I did in college. And that's something I did in my 20s. When I got to my 30, I knew how to play basketball. It's more about just having, making sure your body is fresh, um, you know, and I was always going to be in great shape. So being in shape was something that I wasn't going to ever get out of. But I didn't just I didn't want to practice as much, you know, once I got overseas. You know, I knew how to play basketball. You, you're you not teaching me anything that I don't know. No more than just some plays. Because the game at that at that point in time of having played it 20-plus 20, 20 years, I know how to play mm-hmm. basketball. You're not teaching me something that, okay, a 18-, 19-year-old kid knows. I mean, would, would, would be willing to learn and, and understand – I'm, I know a lot of those things. Not to say that I'm, I'm not at a point of not, not learning any more about the game of basketball, but I just think some of the things that we did on a daily basis I already knew. I'm like, let, let, advance my advance my knowledge of the game. You know, but O'Brien, Coach O'Brien was really good. We had a really good team. I enjoyed playing with those guys. And, uh, you know, it was – I probably had about two or three more really good years after I left overseas. But when I came back, you know, I think with all those practices, you know, my Achilles were really sore. So I didn't want to risk that. And, um, you know, so I, I probably could have stayed over there a little bit longer, you know. And but I also started missing. I'm not going to say I miss home as much. It was more about coming back and kind of reboot my brain, you know, to see if I really want to go back and do this again. You know, because overseas was different for me. It would have been different if it was early in my career. I think later in my career, I didn't want to just go through the grind of, just being somewhere that I really didn't want to be. Mm-hmm. And how do you remember um, the fa- fans uh, in uh, in the Greek league? Because they are one of the most and passionate in the whole Europe. <laughs> they had special fans, man. Those fans were, uh, I kind of compared them to Kentucky fans, man. They, they was uh, probably a little bit more rowdy. They were a little bit more rowdier than Kentucky uh-huh. fans. But those fans really loved and supported that team, man. And, and, and it, it, it was something that was special. You know, if you get a chance to, for anyone listening, um, you know, players that go overseas, if you can play for like Olympiacos, Panathinaikos, one of those two teams, is that they are two of the biggest teams in, 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 uh, in, Greek, uh, in Greece. And, you know, when you play for them, the fans are going to love you and support you to the highest level. Mm-hmm. And I guess that the, the games between uh, Olympiakos Pireus was, was like a battle more than like a games. <laughs> yeah. It was like a war, man. It was like you know if, if you <laughs> if you beat them at you know, uh, at their at their re- arena, you have to run off the floor. Because I remember Michael Chiefs. <laughs> we ended up winning. We, we we won a game in their arena. It was like on a last second tip in. And when I tell you, I mean they started throwing like food and coins and. <laughs> Everything was raining down. Like, I had never played and been a part of a game where I had to exit the floor running. And uh, mm-hmm. but then I understood the, um, you know, how big a rivalry it was. Uh-huh. And to, after your uh, career as a, as a player, you start your, um, your journey as a coach. And uh, for two years, you were assistant coach in Kentucky um, yeah. when John Calipari was a coach. And uh, what did you learn from, from him and uh, how it helps you in your current work as a coach? I think just, you know, trying to balance your, your home life and your, your basketball life. That's something that Coach Cal was really good at. He wasn't a micromanager kind of coach. Um, you know, as long as you did your job, got it done, he allowed you to spend time with your family, have some, some time to yourself. And, I think that's key because college coaching is a 365 day job, you know, from phone calls to text messages to flying and seeing kids play to um, trying to have your own team, making sure they're prepared. You know, so you wear as a head coach, you wear a lot of different hats. So I commend those guys who are lifers and who've been in the game 10, 15, 20 plus years is that they have devoted a lot of their time. So that's the one thing I, that I would say about Worked for Coach Cal, man, that he, he was a, a phenomenal coach to work for. Still stay in contact with him. He enjoys the game. He is a true players coach. Mm-hmm. And how could you describe Tom Nadelic as a coach? Uh, coach Calipari as a coach? Um, uh, Tom Nadelic as a coach. <laughs> uh, me, me it's a time when coach. you could describe your coaching style. 
<laughs> I, I kind of take a lot from all the coaches I played for, from Coach Marvin Menzies, who I worked for in New Mexico State, Coach Calipari, Coach Patino, who I played for, Scott Skiles. I mean, I played for so many good coaches, Jim O'Brien, um, you know, Rick Allerman. I mean, the list goes on and on. You know, playing for all these different teams, you get a chance to kind of learn from each coach and kind of have your own coaching uh, philosophies. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm laid back to a certain point where I, when I have to raise my voice, I raise my voice. But I'm more about teaching young kids, you know, because as I have built my Tony Duck Basketball Academy, I have a third grade, a fifth grade, seventh, ninth and tenth. So it's different personalities in each level of, uh, of competition. And it's really coming in and kind of working with them on certain things I know that's going to help and how the game is being played now. So it's kind of transitioning these guys into – you know, being able to set screen, use screen, being simple, keeping the game simple, understanding your strength and weaknesses, and then utilize your teammates to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. And you've got some players from your academy, academy who are professional basketball players now or have got the potential to be in the future. No, I think these guys are more working towards the middle school, high school, and trying mm -hmm. to get a college um, a college scholarship, you know, um, can they be NBA players? It, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Like, you know, we, I have a lot of really good players and that next level basketball is tough, man. I, I, I don't think kids sometimes understand how good you really have to be. You know, it's only a, a small percentage of guys are going to make it to that next level. And, you know, but as I told some kids yesterday, I said, you no, know, there's different job, job opportunities that the NBA along with college can present you. You know, you can be a GM, you can be a scout, um, you can be involved with analytics, you know, you can do radio, you can do TV. There's so many other jobs besides, okay, just looking at, at myself and just being a player only. You know, that's what makes the NBA such a, a special, special business, special uh, organization. The different organization is that they can present to you 15, 20, 30, 40 different jobs, and you still can be a part of the NBA family. Mm -hmm. Tony, thank you very much for, for this conversation. It was my last question. Uh, it was really a pleasure to have got some knowledge about uh, NCAA and NBA as well as Greek League. Uh, yes. So thank you for our time, uh, for all stories from the NBA and uh, enjoy the lovely day. I see you in the window. This is quite good. Okay, have a good one. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. You're welcome.